Thank you everyone for your patience uh, as I relearn how to be a person in person. Uh, <laughs> welcome to Practice Makes Perfect, Write Accessible Documentation. I am from New York and I'm so happy to be here with all of you in Berlin and with those of you online. Ultimately, I hope that you're going to leave today with some actionable wisdom so you can implement changes right now instead of just learning the philosophy around why accessibility matters. And I hope that you're going to take these best practices to your code and your content, be it documentation, blog posts, or even emails. At the end, I'll share a link with lots of resources so you can continue to learn more. And if you have questions about accessible software design, you should check out the next session on stage one, embracing accessibility in open source. But before I continue and share advice, who am I? Why am I here? Hi, my name is Alexandra White, and I am a technical writer at Google. I work on the Privacy Sandbox Initiative, which develops new web standards out in the open to help make the web safer. It's actually the first time I've gotten to, in my corporate job, work on open source code, which feels really great, <laughs> really love it. Um, I'm also an accessibility advocate, so I work with other technical writers to create best practices and encourage writers to create more accessible content. I'm here because accessibility in open source is critical for the current and future generations of developers. A quick reminder, just in case, why do we care about this? Uh, 4.13 billion people on Earth use the internet. 28% of them, or 1 billion people, have some form of visual impairment. That means anything from wearing glasses, to being colorblind, to having an astigmatism, or a person who is blind. 19% of the world has a cognitive disability which includes intellectual disabilities and developmental disabilities. There are folks with auditory, speech, and neurological disabilities. There are people at this conference who are disabled. You might be able to see it, you might not. But let's start with an accessibility best practice, defining an acronym. A11Y stands for accessibility because there are 11 letters between A and Y, and ally, you know, sounds good, sounds like I'm an ally to accessibility. One more reminder, everyone in this room, everyone who watches this talk is a writer, and we can all do better in our content creation. This is especially critical in our open source work, where people of all levels of education and experience might view and contribute to your work. Okay, on to our first tip, let's get rolling. It's important to start by talking about inclusive language. Inclusive language avoids biases, slang, and any language that discriminates against any group of people based on race, gender, or socioeconomic status. It also avoids language that is ableist or otherwise discriminates against people with disabilities. Inclusive language allows you to resonate with more audiences by speaking and writing in more impartial ways. No matter what you're writing or what we do, we should always aim to be inclusive. When considering how to write and speak with inclusive language, there are words to use and words to avoid. Language to avoid might sound awkward at best or be offensive at worst. And a lot has been said about inclusive language and documentation, we're gonna focus specifically on language for and about disabilities. In general, it's best to emphasize ability over limitations, avoid euphemism, and expect people's preferences to vary, especially when it comes to personal identification. Often in technical language, we come across enable and disable as it relates to toggles and other service activations. We use it sometimes internally, uh, lots of places use it, uh, but we can use better, more appropriate language like turn off and turn on, start and stop, or allow and disallow. For example, a Chrome, Google Chrome security setting, users can find an option related to enhanced protections, 
which allows proactive protection against potentially dangerous websites. Previously, you might have referenced that this toggle as an enable or disable. But when writing step-by-step -step instructions, I recommend you use more precise language. In this case, I've told the user, go to settings, turn on enhanced protections. That's simple. Other language changes have been made more recently by organizations when it comes to inclusion, such as changing blacklist and whitelist to deny list and allow list or other changes. Enable and disable are very common, and there are people who don't want to make this change. I get it, it's been around a long time, but I strongly encourage you to broach this option whenever it's possible to make that change. When it comes to the word disabled and people, disabled is not a bad word. People might have a permanent disability, or be it physical or cognitive. They might have a temporary or situational disability. Everyone in this room, everyone at this conference, everyone in the world will at some point have a temporary or situational disability. That could be having a broken arm, which limits your ability to pick things up. Uh, it could be you're in a really loud room and you can't hear as well as when you're not in a loud room. Wait for people to self-identify before you assume anything about them. We should avoid colloquialisms. In the United States, when I was learning to drive, I was told to always check my blind spot because I couldn't, might not see a car approaching from behind me. But we should never suggest that our users have a blind spot we can use better language. That also, I'm familiar with that in the US. It might not be true in Europe. Maybe folks who learned to drive here were never told that. Remove mental health language as well from any technical and marketing language. You might see something like, the new features are so insane, you've got to check it out. Remove words like insane and crazy from any of your documentation. I'm trying really hard to stop saying crazy. I use it a lot in my everyday language. It's hard. Give yourself a break, but try to do better. These changes help everyone, disabled and abled across the world, understand our content. Tip two, write clear instructions. Along with choosing inclusive and precise language, it's important to use the best possible words to create the clearest instructions. When you write documentation, clear instructions mean write short, complete sentences, use precise, concrete terminology, so avoid jargon and acronyms that are not already defined, use exact measurements when appropriate, say three instead of the number few, or say the number three instead of a few, and for third-person references, use nouns, even if it means being repetitive. Here's an example that could be improved by replacing the pronoun with a noun. It must be hashed, anonymous, and must not contain any personal information or third-party IDs. This is out of context, so it's really hard to know what this writer is talking about, but even in context, it was not clear. By replacing it with your identifier, the reader is sure as to what the author means. This is especially important when it comes to privacy and policy related content. Err on the side of being clearer rather than briefer. Granted, it's not always necessary. We do have to trust that our users and our readers can deduce things from context clues, especially when space is short. In your documentation, break up long tasks into smaller chunks and use examples. Remain positive and use active tense. So let's take a look at some testing examples. Many of us have written these sorts of documentation, how to perform tests, and how you write these depends on who your audience is, how much they know about your product. Often we assume that people know as much as we know that's called the curse of knowledge. So we sometimes forget to share information because we assume that, you're, that the audience already knows. One initiative from the Privacy Sandbox is called 
user agent reduction, which is an effort to minimize information shared in user agent strings, which could be used for passive fingerprinting. Google Chrome is rolling out a reduced user agent header, and in these instructions, you learn how to test your user agent string with the reduced user agent. The steps read, open DevTools, create a custom device, configure an emulated device with a new user agent string, emulate your custom device. What? What does this mean? It assumes that the reader knows what DevTools is, knows how to go create a custom device. It's assuming that you know a lot and are an expert in Google developer tools. So I've written more detailed instructions. First and foremost, let's not assume what browser people are using. There are so many options. Uh, it's really important to start these instructions with open Google Chrome because they only apply to Google Chrome. And it also gives more specific details about where to go in DevTools to test these changes. These could be further improved, have more details, but of course, this is a slide, this is a talk. You know, want it to be a little briefer. Tip three, reduce visual cues. It's possible that some folks who come to your documentation, users and fellow developers, might be visually impaired. Ensure that your readers can understand important information without relying on visual ability. So, don't rely exclusively on the following visual elements to convey information. Colors, patterns, images, font styling, and directional words, such as, you can find that in the top right corner. Always use text or alt text along with any image elements. Let's look at another practical example. This is ingredients for a salad. You might find a recipe online with this ingredients list and the instructions say that the ingredients in red are optional. Take a moment, look at this list. Do you see any problems with that? Relying on color alone, number one problem to indicate that these ingredients are optional. Uh, there are folks who are red, green colorblind, so couldn't tell the difference between the red and the green. Also, the optional ingredients are mixed in. There's no text that says this is optional. So here's an improved list. You can still use red and green. You can still use color indicators, but I would encourage you to use colors that are not really common for folks who are colorblind. Uh, but what's most important about this is also adding that text parenthetical of optional and separating those items so that it's less cognitive load to understand. Tip four, we're moving along, create better links. There are a number of aspects to consider when creating links from target to style to the actual copy. We've all seen click here used in documentation, on websites, in blog posts, everywhere on the internet, it is my personal uh, mission to end click here <laughs> in my documentation and at Google. I will not succeed, but I will keep trying. Using click here is like screaming at your reader. Did you know there's a link here? You should click it. For those who use a screen reader to navigate, click here doesn't tell them anything about where they'll be going. It means Nothing. Think of link texts like signposts. If imagine you're at a shopping mall and all of the stores, the sign just said store. How would you know where you are? How would you know if you're at an Aldi or a TK Maxx or any other store? You would have to look for other clues. For example, the store Sephora uses black and white stripes to indicate where you are. Some people can spot a Sephora a mile away. Uh, loyal Sephora shoppers, they don't even need to see the logo or be in the store to imagine what it's like to be in the store. I know exactly how to walk around and find the products that I need before I reach the front door. When you use Click Here, you're forcing your user to search for context clues. It might sound actionable, but it actually causes friction and increases cognitive load. 
It's important to provide unique, consistent, and meaningful copy in link text to help users know what's going to happen when they click so that they can confidently take action. This is especially important for folks using assistive technology as they might not have the other visual cues. For those who are using a screen reader, again, to navigate, click here is creating huge obstacles. For example, let's say that you're a person with a visual impairment and you encounter links on a page. You might use tabs or other keys to move throughout the site, and the screen reader will announce every stop with the link text and the role. So you might hear, click here, link, click here, link, click here, link, click here, link. Sounds annoying. I'm annoyed with myself. So instead of click here, use meaningful link text to help folks with screen readers and those without know where they're going to go. Use the title of the page, for example. If you've never used assistive technologies, I really strongly recommend you try one out and test your content. Everyday users have many best practices to move through them, such as speeding up the voiceover, but everyone benefits by actually practicing with assistive technologies. And there are a number of different kinds. Screen readers are probably the most common thing that those of us who, who aren't using assistive technologies have heard of. But there are also screen magnification softwares, alternative keyboards, there are dozens. I recommend the W3C has a list of various tools and techniques. Tip five. Write valuable alt text. Alt's intent is to describe images to those who can't see them. And users might not see the image when the image isn't properly loading because they might not have enough data, or they might use a screen reader and rely on alt text. So let's look at an example of an image with matching HTML code. The image is called cheesecake.png. And the alt text says, cheesecake with blueberries sitting on top of a decorative plate. By including alt text with images, we're ensuring that all of our users can appreciate the content on our site. Text in and around an image should present key information about the images. So here are some general best practices. Be contextual, but be concise. Some screen readers actually limit the amount of characters that they'll read in alt text. Uh, for example, also don't start your alt text with image of or screenshot of. That will be clear to the user. You don't need to say it, just describe what's happening. Describe the main character, the emotion, or the event. Write your alt text and the image name in plain language. Read the copy aloud to yourself to make sure that it actually flows with the screen reader. And use keywords sparingly. And keep in mind, not all images actually need alt text. I know a lot of people, when talking about accessibility, will just say, add alt text. That's the answer. But it could be a distraction. It could repeat information that's already in the text. For example, here's some more documentation that I wrote for the Privacy Sandbox per the Google Developer Documentation Style Guide and Accessibility Best Practices, the image of the icon should not have alt text because it represents toggle device toolbar, which is already in the instructions. If I had included alt text, this sentence would have read to a screen reader user, click toggle device toolbar, toggle device toolbar to emulate a device. That's annoying. Let's not repeat information. Remember, test your content so that you don't actually end up confusing your readers. And back to our first example, that cheesecake image. Unless this is part of a recipe or an online cookbook, you might be able to ignore the alt text completely if it's just a decorative element. My last tip, tip six, is the secret to good documentation. Keep your content concise. Why is this important for accessibility? Dense text, acronyms, jargon, whenever you come to a document and it's 20 pages long, it's too much to absorb, break it down, make it easier to read for all people. 
Let's look at another example of some error text that might uh, appear in a console. The text reads, encryption cannot be performed because the primary key version for the key has been destroyed. Create a new key version and make it primary to encrypt the data. This is a real example of real copy. It is really confusing. Here's a new version. To encrypt data with this key, create a new version and make it primary. It's better, right? I think so. I think it's a little better. Here's what we did. We eliminated the repetition. We removed complexity. We front-loaded the objective, encrypting the data. And we used active voice. Clarity makes everything easier to read and easier to translate into different languages. This allows your audience to focus on learning rather than trying to comprehend really complicated language. In this talk, we covered six ways for you to create more accessible content. Use inclusive language, write clear instructions, reduce visual cues, create better links, write valuable alt text, and keep your content concise. What's one thing that you'll do differently? It's impossible to do everything all at once, and sometimes we become overwhelmed, and then we don't actually improve. Focus on one thing that you'll do better. And by attending this talk, you've taken your first step towards more accessible writing. You can find all of these tips, resources, and a style guide at alexand.us slash a11y hyphen tips. And I'll share that again on Twitter for anybody. And thank you so much for listening. I look forward to hearing your questions. So thanks for your talk. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? Hi. Uh, so you said something about images, right? Like use less and less image cues or... or and in my, in my experience, what I've seen is more and more people find it easier to have screenshots. So if it is like, uh, you know, you need to uh, do these three steps to be able to get this thing running. Mm -hmm. And usually what I've seen is screenshots help most people more than written text because I immediately see what I need to do. And I could do it in 30 seconds instead of three minutes uh, having to read the whole thing. So, and it's also very difficult to have an alt text for screenshots. So how do you, so how do you suggest the, the, the methodology should be in, in terms of like, how do you think, or like how much percentage should you use screenshots? Because I know that it cannot be got, uh, you cannot get rid of it completely. Yeah. So like, what should the strategy be in terms of what percentage of screenshot should be allowed instead of, you know, yeah. It's from that way, yeah. I love screenshots. I also love video instructions, especially when doing things. Um, I bought a bidet for home, and I got these awesome written instructions and a video to install it myself, and I am not a plumber, and that was super important. Uh, you should definitely use screenshots because they are helpful, but also have the written text. It, I think it's better to not have alt text in a screenshot and to include the alt text outside of it so someone could see side by side, here's the written steps and here's a visualization of those steps. It doesn't need to be repeated in the alt text because, again, somebody who is a screen reader user who's visually impaired and can't see it, they don't need to hear the instructions twice. They only need to hear it once. So using them side by side, don't add alt text. That's the, that's the secret. There's no percentage that should be allowed. Use screenshots as long as they're updated. They're terrific. Hi, thank you. Um, uh, do you have any advice for making the structure of documentation more accessible? So talking about the, like the sidebar, the overall how you categorize pages, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yes. And in another world, I gave a talk just on semantic HTML because that is the answer. Um, making sure that the HTML value actually equals whatever the content is. So header one is the title, header two is the first header on the page after the title, et cetera, et cetera. Um, making sure that 
actually testing with a, a screen reader is the, the best way to know, does this make sense? You can hide some elements, so uh, a user doesn't necessarily always need every piece of information in the sidebar if it's a distraction. Um, making sure that the content is read first or that they can jump ahead to the navigation if that's what they're looking for. So being really clear with the actual HTML, what it is, and using ARIA elements um, are another way to help instruct the flow.